we welcome you again to Glad Tidings Hour. The program that we have prepared for you will be a blessing, I trust, and as we listen to the songs and the storyline for this day's program, along with the message from the Bible, I am praying that God will speak into all our hearts and minister to us in the precious name of Jesus. The first song we are playing today is a great and well-known hymn, and it's Anita MacDonald, our good friend from Scotland, who is singing it. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright. And after we listen to this song, then my wife Yvonne is going to come and share her story for today. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light, for the sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. listening can hear this song I cannot sing for the sunshine blessed sunshine while the peaceful happy moments roll when Jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in my soul there is gladness in my soul today and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now for joys laid up above for the sunshine blessed sunshine while the peaceful happy moments roll when Jesus shows a smiling face there is sunshine in my soul Yes, our hymn writer today is Eliza Hewitt. Now that hymn that's just been sung was one of hers. Anita from Fraserburgh, North East Scotland, uh, is, was singing it and Peter Jackson, the blind pianist from Wales, was playing alongside her. Now that was one of her first hymns and one of her best known hymns to this day. Eliza Edmonds Hewitt was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on the 28th of June, 1851, and spent her life there. Her father, James Stratton Hewitt, was a sea captain who was born in New Jersey in 1823. Her mother, Zeruiah Edmonds, was also born in New Jersey in 1823. She was their second child and the first daughter of the family. She was educated in the public schools of that city and after graduation from the girls' high school obtained a position as a teacher. This career, however, was cut short by the development of a spinal injury which caused her to be shut in for many years. It is thought that her injury may have been caused by a boy who had been disciplined, striking her in the back with a heavy slate after the injury, Eliza was placed in a heavy cast for six months. When her doctor let her go for a short walk in a park near her home on a warm spring day, her heart overflowed with joy. That was when she penned, There is sunshine in my soul today. As her hymns increased in number and became wider known, she loved to hear from around the world how her poems and hymns had helped people. Although she was an invalid for an extended period, she developed a love for God and the scriptures, and she shared her hymns with others. She wrote Sunday school literature and children's poems. She also enjoyed studying English literature. Her condition eventually improved, and she was able to return to an active life in Christian ministry. She served on the staff of a home for friendless children. 
Later, she became superintendent of the primary department of a large Presbyterian church. There was no place she was happier than in her beloved primary room, surrounded by her bright young teachers and class of 200 lively children whom she loved. She continued teaching until her death in 1920, writing many hymns to supplement her teaching. Professor Sweeney, a renowned musician and publisher, saw some of her work and wrote to her, asking for some contributions he could put to music. This led to her becoming known by his friend, Professor W. J. Kirkpatrick, another famous musician, and she wrote many poems for him to use. Some of them were published in songbooks as early as 1871, when she was just 20. More About Jesus Would I Know is one of her first published hymns. It openly and shamelessly expresses a desire to be closer to God. Penned by a woman in a body cast, it shows us how we should pursue him. Eliza was invited to summer revival meetings held annually at the Methodist campgrounds in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. These meetings attracted some notable musicians and writers. And that was where she met the famous blind songwriter, Fanny Crosby. Although Fanny was 31 years older than Eliza, they remained firm friends for life. Here are some extracts of a poem Eliza wrote about Fanny, which was read at her funeral in 1915. She cleverly wove some of Fanny's hymns into the narrative. Away to the country of sunshine and song, our songbird has taken her flight. And she who has sung in the darkness so long, now sings in the beautiful light. What heart can conceive of the rapture she knows, awakened to glory so bright, where radiant splendour unceasingly glows, where cometh no shadow of night. Her life work is ended, and over the tide, redeemed in his presence to stand, she knows her Redeemer for her crucified by the print of the nails in his hand. To rescue the perishing, her greatest delight, what bliss in the homeland to meet with those she is told of the Lord's saving might, together to bow at his feet. Some day we will meet in the city above, together we'll look on his face, safe, safe in the arms of the Jesus we love, together we'll sing Saved by Grace. Quite a number of those Heavens, you'll remember. Eliza died five years later in Philadelphia on the 24th of April, 1920, at the age of 68. Eliza Hewitt penned thousands of hymns. Had she never been bedridden, she might never have written them. Most of her best-known hymns focus on Jesus, her Saviour and Lord. Here are some you may have heard. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Will there be any stars, any stars in my crown? Victory in Jesus. More about Jesus would I know. Since the fullness of his love came in. Abundant salvation through Jesus I know. And oh for a heart that is whiter than snow. It is interesting to see the influence of the Methodist camp meetings and their emphasis on full salvation coming through in her writings in hymns like Abundant Salvation through Jesus I Know. Now we're going to listen to Gordon Quinn, a friend of ours from the west of the province, and he's singing that hymn, Abundant Salvation. Abundant salvation through Jesus I know. For it streams of refreshing from Calvary. Oh, no. 
attended the Methodist camp meetings in Ocean Grove, New Jersey, she met Emily Wilson, the Methodist district superintendent's wife, who was also a musician. She showed her poem she called Heaven to Emily, who added the tune, and the hymn When We All Get to Heaven was born. The year was 1898. It lives on today in many hymn books. Eliza's scriptural inspirations for the song are many. The first verse concludes with the words right out of the opening verses of John chapter 14. In the mansions, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. The second verse is a reminder of Revelation 2.4, that in heaven all sorrow, pain and death are vanquished. Eliza's phrase is, not a shadow, not a sigh. 
In verse 3, we are challenged to continue serving the Master despite many trials. It will be worth it all when we get just one glimpse of Him in glory. Verse 4 refers to two physical aspects of heaven, taken from Revelation 21, verse 21. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. Mildred is going to sing it for us now, Mildred Rainey, and if you know it, why don't you sing along with her? We will have another of Eliza's hymns at the end of the programme, sung by Paul Erwin. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay onward to the prize before us soon his beauty we'll behold soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory Now, haven't we been richly blessed through the cheerful ministry and the messages in these great hymns that were written by Eliza? I praise God today for the joy of having a Savior who brings light and life and joy and peace into our hearts. And I trust and pray that you know that for yourself and that you guard it diligently in these tumultuous days and that you keep close to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to read now from the New Testament Scriptures, and I'm reading from the third chapter of Second Peter. I want to read you some verses from 2 Peter, chapter 3, commencing to read at verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, 
looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. We shall conclude our Bible reading there at the 14th verse, and I trust that the Lord will bless his word to our hearts. Now, as we come to the message today from the Bible, let's just have a short prayer before we come to it. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for what we have heard already, and we bless you, Lord, for all the ministry that these beautiful hymns have been to so many people and so many places. And I pray that now, today, in this little message, that the Holy Spirit himself will take the words and the message and speak into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray and for your glory. Amen. This chapter that Peter has left us with, the last chapter of his second epistle, is a very interesting chapter. Because the Apostle Peter is looking into the future and he's thinking about things that are yet to come. And we think about Peter's words in these tumultuous days in which we live. We're living in a topsy-turvy world. We're living in days of uncertainty. We're living in days when fearfulness is taking hold of many hearts. And we realize that we are in the end time days. And we ought to be thinking very seriously and constantly about the return of Jesus Christ. And so the vision that Peter had as he was writing his chapter is the vision that I want us to have. And I want to share that with you today. In the Bible reading that we had, we read these words. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And that was verse 14. In Second Peter chapter 3, we have the last recorded message from the Apostle Peter. And not long after writing this epistle, he would be martyred, for his faith and testimony for Jesus Christ. And one would think that his imminent and violent death would dominate his thoughts, but nothing could be further from the truth, because here is a man whose vision transcends the circumstances of his life, goes beyond the issues that are most pressing on him in the physical sense, the fact that his life is about to be terminated. His vision goes beyond and penetrates the, beyond the circumstances. And he is caught up with the coming again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The bright beams of coming glory are flooding his mind. And so he must write and he must tell out the truth to those who would read his message. The entire chapter focuses on end time realities and how we ought to respond to them. And to help you to remember what I want to share I'm going to give you some brief headings. And first of all, in verse 9, there is a motivation to personal repentance. The ninth verse is a strong incentive to those who are without Jesus Christ to make preparation by a true repentance toward God. And what do we read? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That's concerning his return and his promise to come again. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What a tremendous verse. And as I speak to you today, I'm speaking to you about the one living and true God, who has always been long-suffering toward a sinful humanity. He was so in the days of Noah, when people were exceedingly wicked. And for a long, long time, God's servant Noah preached to them, but they wouldn't listen. And the Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. It was so also in the days before the judgment that came on Sodom and Gomorrah, when the cities near to the region that we now know as the Dead Sea were dealt with in a blaze of fire. And it says the whole place went up like the smoke of a furnace. 
Again, God gave a scoffing and wicked and rebellious and unrighteous people ample time to turn from their ways and seek his mercy. But because God didn't execute judgment quickly, they assumed that he had turned a blind eye to their evil ways. What they didn't realize was it was the mercy of God that was holding back the judgment in the hope that they would seek his face. Let me turn that historic circumstance around and bring it right into the current moment in your life. Perhaps you're the person today that's going to hear and you're going to respond. I might be speaking to someone today who is acting just like these people. You have presumed on the mercy of the Lord. You have refused to call out for his forgiveness. You have refused to repent and say goodbye to your sin. You have rejected the precious blood of Jesus Christ and the pardon that is offered to you through the cross work of our Savior. Remember this. Someday opportunity will pass by forever and you will be lost eternally. And you need to seek the Lord while he may be found. And we read these words. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Again we read, this day is the day of salvation. It's the acceptable time. And there's no better time than now to get right with God. Oh, I pray that even as we move closer to the Lord's return, that you will get into the kingdom, into the family of God, that you will seek Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Your salvation and the possibility of being saved, that price that was necessary to make provision, has been made. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on Calvary's cross for you. And today, all things are ready. And all you've got to do is come as you leave your old ways and seek the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thought about this chapter that Peter has written here is that in it there is an incentive to practical godliness. Because in verse 11, which we read, he says this, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What's he speaking about? He's speaking about the heavens and things as we see them today this natural world in which we live, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? When Peter is speaking about all these things, he's saying the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, if Peter's message was pertinent 2,000 years ago and urgent, then how much more in 2024? For the apostle, motivation was more important than speculation. And he left the when and how and where to the Lord. And that's why he says in the next breath, seeing then that all these things, now not all believers see eye to eye in the mechanics of prophecy. There are different uh, ideas and different interpretations, but there ought to be unity as to the practical impact on our everyday living. And what is that practical impact? Holy conversation. And that means behavior. That means every aspect of your life. And godliness, that's how God's servant describes it. And while at the same time, we may are to be looking for the coming of the day of God. So, couple those two things together. The type of life that we live and the expectation that we maintain. And what is that expectation? Looking for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And there's a key word right in there that governs all else in our living. And it's the word looking, looking. There's a wonderful hymn, an Advent hymn. The second Advent, that is, I'm thinking about, because the first Advent was when he came as a, an infant to Bethlehem. But the next time he's not coming to a manger, he's coming in glory. And what does the hymn say? Let all that look for hasten that coming joyful day, by earnest consecration to walk the narrow way. 
The third thing that I want to mention is that there is an exhortation to personal sanctity. And in verse 14, the last verse which we read, here were the words, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. It's very interesting that Peter refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb without blemish and without spot. And in the mind and message of this wonderful man of God, he is emphasizing a personal likeness to Jesus. One of the conditions that is mentioned for his people at his returning again. I find that one of the most interesting New Testament studies is the relationship between the message of the Lord's return and the importance of the sanctified heart and the godly life. The bridegroom is coming, and we read that he's coming for a white-robed bride, namely his church. And the hymn writer asked the question, When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Thank God today there's a power in the precious blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all that defiles us, everything that spots and uh, everything that stains our nature. There is power to purify the heart and make you and me perfectly whole. Now, when the Apostle Peter writes, he doesn't say, I want you to be found without spot and faultless, because that's not for this life. But that's the prize for the world to come. But the life of devotion and purity of motive and fervent zeal and holy love and fullness of joy, all these are predicated in the Spirit-filled life. This was the emphasis of the Thessalonian letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers there at Thessalonica, namely that the believers would have hearts that were established unblameable in holiness before God at the coming of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul's concluding prayer for these believers is, The very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. Martin Luther put it, through and through. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body. Notice the order from the inward right out to the outward. Spirit, soul and body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter and the Apostle Paul were emphasizing the same message. There was agreement in this kind of preparation of heart and mind and life and attitude and perspective in the light of the Lord's near return. Finally, there is a stimulation to persistent watchfulness. We didn't read this verse, but here's what it says in verse 17. Ye therefore beloved. Who are the beloved? Those who have come to Jesus Christ those who have trusted in the finished work of the cross, those whose robes have been white, made white by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You know, the Bible says, In the last days many shall be part from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But the Lord doesn't want us to be those kind of people. He wants us to be steadfast. Who was better fitted to encourage his readers in this context? Well, the Apostle Peter, he remembered uh, maybe the sad outcome of carelessness. He knew the grief of failure, and he learned the hard way. But what a man of unwavering courage he became after his spiritual recovery. Time after time, you and I are alerted to the danger of becoming careless in our walk with God. The warnings are real, and they are more pronounced as we move closer to the end of this age. And I remind you of these words, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The last church that was written to in the book of the Revelation and the letters to the seven churches was the church at Laodicea. And some people interpret the letters to the churches as a picture of the church age. 
and what it will be like when we come to that end time scenario. Lukewarmness characterized the church at Laodicea. And there was a cooling off and a falling away and people departing from the faith. And because iniquity shall abound, the Bible says, the love of the many shall wax cold. I don't want to be amongst that number. I want to have a heart that's on fire for Jesus. Oh, don't you too? I trust you do. These are just a few random little uh, emphases and sound bites from the Word of God that I want you to give attention to today. Peter's Beware is a loving, sincere alarm bell for all. God's people in these evil days, yes indeed. It was Charles Wesley who wrote, Arm me with zealous care, as in thy sight to live, and O oh, thy servant Lord prepare, as strict account to give. But having said what I've said, and taking those warnings and those exhortations from the Apostle Peter, he doesn't leave us with a negative note. Here is his antidote to that. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You know the coming of the Lord is near. The day of His appearing will soon be here. And I want us to be found in Him, without spot and blameless, at His appearing. Here's a quick reflection. First of all, there's a motivation to personal repentance. Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned from the wicked and evil ways and the broad road that leads to destruction? Have you sought the Savior? Have you come to the cross? You can do that today if you have never done so. There is an incentive to practical godliness in verse 11. There is an exhortation to personal sanctity in verse 14. There is a stimulus to persistent watchfulness. You know, in the earlier part of our program today, Eliza Hewitt was our featured songwriter. And another one of her songs was, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? Emphasizing the importance of being involved in the ministry of winning people to Jesus Christ and living for the day when faithful service will be rewarded by the Lord. Well, may we be found amongst those who will bring many by the grace of God and the enabling ministry of the Spirit, bringing many with us to the glorious heaven above. Now, we're going to conclude our program today with a song by Mr. Paul Irwin, as Yvonne did intimate earlier on. And the song is another of Eliza Hewitt's wonderful songs, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown?
When his face I behold, lifting gems at his feet to lay down. It will sweeten my bliss in the city of gold, should there be any stars in my The Bible says, They that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. And it's not so much about stars in our crown, although we're thinking about bringing people with us to glory, but it's to be like a shining star in life and then throughout God's great eternity. May the Lord write His word into all our hearts today for the Savior's sake and glory. Eric Stewart saying, Bye-bye, and God bless you again today. <music>